when you're at the start of your career, having a curious mind, being interested, because what that what happens with if you have that is that you start to ask questions, and that's how people notice you. But I think it starts with curiosity, and that's why finding the right business to be in that's interesting to you, I think, is helpful. My name is Sarah Gomez and I'm the Chief People Officer at Lloyds of London. Lloyds is a brand that many people know about and if any of you have been into London or are from the area, you will know it's a really iconic building in the centre of the city. It was built in the 1980s and was really heralded as a bit of an eyesore actually because it was amongst all these stone buildings and it's still got that iconic status now. It's the only grade one listed building, it's the youngest grade one listed building there is, which means we can't do anything to make it more green, which is infuriating. Um, Lloyd's is a marketplace. The best way to describe it is it's a marketplace to bring people together to buy and sell insurance. And, and insurance, we tend to think of as, you know, the things that your parents perhaps moan about, that house insurance and car insurance. And Lloyd's of London actually insures what's known as specialty risk. It's really cool. Uh, but people just don't understand what it is. So we write almost £50 billion worth of insurance a year, really big numbers, over 200 territories. So it's a global organisation. And, we, and we, we, we basically look at what risks there are and we price those so that people can insure against them. So, you know, exciting things like where are floods going to be, which countries are prone to floods or earthquakes, which trade routes are safe. We've actually been insuring some of the ships that are bringing grain out of the Ukraine and, and the importance of that in the world economy really can't be underestimated. We insure things like whether autonomous vehicles are going to be safe to drive. And then some really random ones. We insured apparently um, Daniel Craig in in one of his um, in James Bond films. We've insured the Beatles. Uh, so, you know, it's really very, very varied. And just think about it as risk rather than insurance. Yeah. And, it's, and you know, you say that those are things that are so, so important that you don't even think about. And, it, and you know, if we think about like the tragedies of recent uh, natural disasters and, you know, things like that, things that have happened, you know, it's such a tragedy in and of itself. Um, but if there wasn't the insurance that there was there, then it would be even worse for so many people, um, you know, to at least it's that backstop and it. It's so fundamental, isn't it? It's really nice. It's the first time, I think, that I've been in a business that has true purpose. So the Lloyd's Market has a a purpose around sharing risk to create a braver world. And we really are doing purposeful work, uh, you know, and are very much um, in the conversation about how we ensure the transition. So, you know, we will have firms that currently will insure for coal, for example. That's something you have to transition through. And that's that's a conversation which we have with both government, with other big organisations. So working for Lloyd's puts you front and centre of things that really do make the economy and the world a better place. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fantastic. Yeah, and yeah, great to explain. Like I was thinking, I thought I kind of knew all the different types of things, but then you go through them and you, you actually know. But, um, and just quickly tell us, you know, uh, without being humble, please, um, you know, the responsibility of a chief people officer. And it's really helpful, you know, if it's in numbers and, you know, things to people and numbers of people that you have to look after and, and the types of um, decisions you have to make. It's really varied. The simplest way I describe what I do is it's my responsibility and my teams to make sure that the business has the people in it that have the capability, that are able, have the skills to do what the business needs them to do and that they're engaged in doing that. They want to do it. So can they do it and do they want to do it is sort of the really simplest way. Um, and we do a whole range of things from the really important operational HR, so making sure that people are paid, that they have the right contracts, that we have the right policies in place for safety, security, diversity, inclusion, all of those um, elements, right through to what are we doing about future talent, how are we progressing that through, where are we recruiting from? Um, we will counsel and coach our senior leaders to make sure they have the leadership capability. We make sure we have proper training in place. It's a really varied career. HR is a bit like insurance, actually. People don't wake up and go, oh, I want to work in insurance today or I want to be an HR professional today. Um, but it's, a, I mean, the reason I love it is it enables you to move around. I've done many sectors. So I've worked in travel. I've worked in banking. I'm in insurance. I've worked in retail. And it's the kind of career that you really can move around. It's very transferable. And and, uh, and enables you to sort of build up and either go into a specialism. So I came up through a learning and development specialism and then moved into what we call general HR. 
other people come up through recruitment. So it's a career that has lots of different angles and lots of opportunity to be a, a deep specialist. You know, you can do data, you can do MI, so you can come in as a specialist or you can be much more of what we call a generalist, which is a more relationship-based role, really. Mm, yeah, lots of the young people that we work with are you know, always interested in working with people and helping and supporting people and making decisions that affect people. So it's it's a, a great thing, I think, that... Um, there's a transition more to describing HR human resource as people, right? Like, you know, chief people officer versus chief yeah. HR officer and things like that. So, you know, on the, the decisions, I, ha I had one uh, last week where we've been supporting uh, somebody in our business who's had some quite tragic family circumstances and we've been uh, helping her with getting some counselling for that and we fund it as part of the benefits that, that Lloyd's offers. We've got a very strong range of benefits. And she wrote to me saying it was coming up to the anniversary of this particular incident. Could we extend... Um, the counselling and, and I said yes of course we can we'll you know we'll we'll put it out to the floor and she just was thank you and and, that, and that's when I realised that we are doing things that make a real difference to people and and that's you know that that's the nice part of what we can do for people yeah no I mean again amazing to hear and something that you know, puts an old an old school institution in terms of age into a forward thinking bracket which is you know really important so tell us you know uh, I always say this on these interviews you know you didn't you didn't um, you know, grow up and then suddenly become the uh, chief HR or chief people officer of Lloyds of London. You know, there was a lot in between. But tell us uh, what you were like when you were a young person, you know, the age of the audience uh, watching or listening to this. And, um, you know, I know just before we were talking, I said, you know, you told me you bombed your A-levels, for example. That's not something people would expect. But maybe just give us a picture of you as a, as a young person. I would say if I was if I was trying to position it in a way I wanted it to be said, I would say I was very confident and take that as meaning bossy. So I was definitely a, a bossy, you know, a bossy kind of going into my early teens. I was very sporty. I was really competitive. Then that came through in my sport. Um, and then very sociable. Um, and and because of some of those things, I didn't I didn't do as well academically as um, as I perhaps should have done, or people thought I would. And yeah, I I really I did bomb my A levels. They were the the most dreadful results. Um, but my dad had always been saying to me for years that he wanted me to go into this Marks and Spencer training program. It was a long time ago in the eighties, and it was a, it was a big thing to do. So I sort of always had that in my mind. Um, and was going through that. So I was lucky that I didn't need those results to get into a job. Um, and I had already decided I didn't want to go to university. So I think that was part of it. I was the only one of my friends that didn't go to university. I just was re really realistic. I knew I would just enjoy the partying. I wouldn't study enough. And I wanted to earn money. And because of that competitive nature, I think that came through. And I'd always worked. So I started, well, when I got my first Saturday job when I was 11 years old, I worked in a tiny little store that it was called Jackson's Discounts. And then I wasn't allowed to be paid in those days because I was too young. So I used to just take home goods. So he would let me, you know, take home shampoo or, you know, you know kitchen cleaning stuff. And I would sell it to the family. Uh, and I had to wait eight weeks with no goods so I could earn a radio at the end of the eight weeks. So, but I loved it. And so that kind of got me into the world of work. So for me, it was just very natural that I would go to work rather than go to study. And um, yeah. and it, and I guess it started from there, really. It's uh, the thing about that, like the narrative nowadays is get you, you have to get really good grades. You know, that's like the whole point of school um, to get into university or to go to college or just to, you know, have that on your CV so people take you seriously. And I'm wondering, you know, you, as you said, it was sort of different for you because you didn't need those grades to get into um, m &S. But if you're thinking about, um, you know, young people now who maybe didn't get the grades that they wanted to uh, at school, but, you know, they're, they're not um, completely no grades, they've got some qualifications. Yeah, you know, what advice would you give or what thoughts would you give about how that comes across to employers, for example, and is that the be all and end all? I mean, look, I think for certain professions, they're absolute requirements. So if 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 you you know if you want to go and study to be a doctor or a physicist, then you're going to need a, a level of of academia for, for sure. But there are many, many, many careers that you can do that you should look at. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think I would just think about. I don't want to talk about it for too long because we haven't got long. But you know, my three children are very different. So my eldest son, who's now thirty, similar to me, just bombed his A levels. We, he then decided to go to college and did a vocational course in being prepared to join one of the services, so the police or the or the, the fire service or the ambulance service. And it was a much more vocational course and really thrived. It was really disciplined and he just responded to that. 
my daughter's a complete academic. She's got a degree in marine biology. She's got a, a, a master's in conservation, uh, earns very little. My son's doing very well, thank you very much, earning a lot of money. My daughter is not earning very much, but in a job she adores that is working in, uh, she used to work for WWF recently. So she's working in conservation, everything she wants to do. And so is utterly satisfied, but not earning. And then I have a, a much younger son who's 19 who looked at both of them and, and said, okay, where, where do I want to go? You know, Katie's got doing what she loves, not earning much, lots of debt. Sam is doing a job which tires him, but he quite likes, but no debt. And and he actually chose to go on a, down an apprenticeship room then this year. Um, he got good exam results he was at um, a private school and his teachers and his uh, classmates could not fathom why he wasn't going to university. It was a real lesson for me in this, this total focus we have on university and it is absolutely not the only route. You know, his friends said to him, well, what will you do if you don't go to university? He's like, well, I'm going to get a job. Well, how will you do that with that? But he's like, do you not know any of this stuff? So we have to open our eyes and apprenticeships are a really good route. I think GCSEs are vital. You've got to get good grades. You know, you need maths, you need English, and you've got to get a decent grade in those, I think, to give you half a leg up. Um, but but beyond that, you've got to be really w- w- wide open to opportunities. Actually, he didn't take it. He got a job at Lloyd's, funnily enough, not through me, turned us down and went to a different company uh, and started as an operation analyst and loves it. And is now, what you know, he's been there six months, he's working there. So I think you, you've got to think about what's right for you, but don't despair. I mean, look, I'm living proof that you can you can, you can can do whatever you want with the right, right set, I think. Uh, well, it's, as you say, living proof. And you've heard it uh, straight from the Chief People Officer of Lloyd's of London that, you know, apprenticeships are really viable options and that this overemphasis uh, for a lot of young people on university and if you don't go to university, what are you going to do is not the case. And your own son, you know, uh, is is uh, is kind of pursuing that route, which you know, I think is really important to mention. And so, yeah, that's, that's really important. They've both got their benefits. You know, university is a great place to go. It's a great place for you to sort of start to mature. It's a great place to get the qualifications if you want to do something specific, um, but it's not the only route. So there's one more thing that I'd, I'd really like to kind of delve into, um, which kind of I think ties into your the main piece of advice that you know, we've spoken about before, which is this idea of um, you know imposter syndrome, and uh, you know you sort of spoke about being a female leader, you spoke about uh, smart people being around you, or you know educated academic people, and um, and you also sort of spoke a little bit about uh, feeling like you've only just got over your imposter syndrome, but. Talk to us a little bit about that and and off the back of that, you know, thinking about young people now, maybe you're speaking to a 20 year old version of Sarah, but in 2023, like what, 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 what have you learned and what would you pass on because of that experience around imposter syndrome? I think the thing that I'm very convinced of now is that we all have to understand our strengths and dial those up. Um, and just, just understanding that I think stops you thinking about the things you can't do. So I think that's that's the first thing. But I, you know, it, I I can remember I don't know, fifteen years ago talking to one of my bosses, and he's like, "Sarah, you've found your place. You've got your leadership place. Why are you still?" And actually, mine was coming out, and I was a bit I was a bit what he called elbows out. I was a bit kind of aggressive in trying to get my place. And he's like, "People respect you already. You don't need to do that." But it's still there, and I definitely had this, and it is very recently that it's gone. This sort of just this, am I good enough? And I'm, I am I am still a bit in awe of clever people. You know, I love to listen to, to I find it hard to actually follow some of the things they're saying, but I just am in awe of what I think are clever people. People will say I'm clever. People will say I'm pragmatic, I'm streetwise, I, you know, I'm commercial. But I just have this academic thing that I just, it's going to be with me, I suppose. Um, but there is this, just this um, finding your place and finding how you fit and what that looks like that, that that has to come from you. And, you know, I said I was quite bossy and quite confident. And so I used to find it quite hard to explain about how, why I've been successful as a woman in a leadership position, because I just used to say, well, it, it's me. And I felt that was really inadequate to say that to people. But then what I realised is that we've all got something inside us and, and it's about self-belief. And if you don't automatically have it, it's how do you access it? And finding that, so because people sort of can smell confidence, and we talk in leadership terms about pre- leadership presence, for example, and it's things like when you're at the start of your career, having a curious mind, being interested, because what that what happens with if you have that is that you start to ask questions, and that's how people notice you. 
um, and and you start to have a point of view about things. And then you start to learn as you mature through about when it's appropriate to say things and how to phrase them and all those sorts of things. But I think it starts with curiosity. And 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 that's why finding the right business to be in that's interesting to you, I think, is helpful. You know, that's why I was saying about my daughter, she's in a business that she loves and therefore that energy comes out. And, and insurance is just, is just one of those areas where because of the variety, there's really something for everybody um, to, to come in and work as an industry. Does, does that does that give you a sense of um, of kind of exactly that definitely does you know like talking about the the story and I think the the thing that sometimes I think young people think is that if you are at the top of your game right like you are you are basically the most senior position you can be in in your field in probably one of the most well respected you know uh, organizations in the professional services world they think that you won't have any vulnerabilities or you won't have any um, you know you're sort of the finished product. But just being able to say, uh, you know, I still am in, in awe of certain types of people and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think that, again, just makes it so much more human and attainable and achievable. And, you know, there will be someone who who can really see themselves in you. Um, and, and maybe they can say, well, if, if Sarah can do it, you know, maybe I can one day. So I think that's a really good way to kind of picture it. And you always learn. He's always learning, right? So I was in a meeting this week and I had a, a, a four people coming into my office to talk to me about an initiative that we've got actually around um, around early careers and and our out, outreach program. And they were they were giving me a briefing on a session we're going to run. And one of the one of the men came in, and he's one of our uh, guys who's is in the early careers. And he came in his suit. I never see him in a suit. And I said, "Oh, Chris, you look great today." And he's like, "Well, I thought I'd get you know, I thought I'd get my, my suit on because I'm coming into your office," which was really just struck me about gosh I speak to him almost every other day or so but it was this big thing for him and anyway as they came in I I genuinely wasn't up to speed with the amount of work they've been doing so I just said look can you just give me an overview of where we've got to and you can kind of all see them looking I said no I'm asking because I don't know that I need you to bring me up to not because I want to check anything but genuinely but people think that you know everything and you don't and I had a, another a slightly different example this week where I've had to um Actually, travel up nearly up to Scotland to see somebody who is who is off work at the moment with ill health, and it was going to be a very difficult conversation for lots of different reasons, but one that I was very nervous about. And I had a briefing session that morning with two people um, who report in through my team for me to practice what I wanted to say, for example. And how do you think this will land? And are there any other questions you think I should be saying? Because we don't know everything. You can never know everything, um, and I think it's about. Um, it's about humility and just you know just not being afraid to say I don't I don't know I mean I'm I sit in an executive meeting of people who understand insurance and the technical aspect far better than me and actually I, I quite like that because I can go I, I say this I say look can I ask the donkey question what what was that that you just I don't understand what that was because when you don't understand something you can sit outside of it and therefore you can sort of observe different things that are going on in if nothing about the content but maybe around what you're observing in terms of the decision making process for example so i know that my chief exec uh, values in me that i will br- i will uh, challenge conversations between our executives our chief finance officer for example because i'll see something that others won't because i i'm not as, in my words not as clever therefore i'm looking for something different and i think that's something around you find your place you find your value <laughs>